Welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about the Arcanists. Uh, the Arcanists are kind of two groups in one. You've got the Miners and Steamfitters Union, the MNSU, who represents miners, uh, engineers, all the people who make Malifaux tick. They yep. harvest the soul yep. stone, they bring it out. But underneath the surface, there's the Arcanists, which is this secret underground organization of magicians. Mm -hmm. it's people who want to practice magic outside of the strictures of the guild. People who want to practice free magic. So they smuggle soul stones, they smuggle people, yep. they help people hide from the guild. Now, these organizations were originally led by Victor Ramos, who is a brilliant inventor and also a rogue magician. And but, now, and in prison. In prison. <laughs> Victor Ramos was captured by the guild at the end of second edition and is rotting in a jail cell. And in his absence, the Arcanists are having some tensions between their two halves. Uh, so it remains to be seen how that will play out. But overall, the faction is full of weird and wild magicians, but also hardworking union men and women. We've already talked about one of the masters in one of our other faction focus, focus videos, Charles Hoffman. So why don't we talk a little bit about Colette? Colette. Colette Dubois is a stage magician who runs the Star Theater. Uh, the Star is pretty much the place to go for entertainment if you're a hardworking Malifaux citizen where you can see feats of wondrous, dazzling magic and illusion on stage as mechanical doves fly out of Colette's hat and her showgirls put on a wonderfully choreographed performance. Yeah, Colette was actually one of the masters that caught my attention when I first got into Malifaux back in second edition. Um, very nearly ended up being an Arcanist player instead of Bayou. Well, thank God that you dodged that bullet. Yeah, tell me about it. Uh, Colette is a lot of fun, though. Uh, as a magician, she's much more about tricks and uh, illusions than she is about just straight up killing people. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you can easily play an entire game with a Colette crew and never kill an enemy model, but still manage to score your points. And deny your opponent's points. She's yeah. very good at that. Yeah, definitely. The way that Colette plays is really sort of a shell game. Uh, she can trick your opponent, she can obfuscate what her intentions are, and she can prevent your opponent from being able to score their points by um, burying their models, burying herself... Um, she can slow, distract, uh, even stun and stagger your opponent's models. And she does have a couple of pretty hard-hitting models in her crew. Yeah, those Corifei duets, uh, ballerinas with blade arms that are mechanical, yep. they are pretty nasty to deal with. Yeah, easily one of the most powerful models in the game, I would say. And Colette's title version, Colette Dubois Smuggler, is all about acting through her decoy markers so she can put out these decoys and then make them do stuff instead of having to do it herself. Yeah, action efficiency is the name of the game with Colette too, for sure. Uh, both versions of Colette are nice and tricky. Uh, there's a lot of play to them. They maybe aren't the most beginner-friendly crews, but once you have a couple games under your belt and you understand the way Malifaux is played, you can give your opponent a headache with, Mal with Colette. Yeah, serious headache, that's for sure. Uh, and on the other end of the complexity spectrum from Colette is Anacelia Karras. Uh, Karis was the apprentice of Ramos before he went to prison, and she has basically stepped up to be in charge of the sneaky magician underground half of the Arcanists. And Karis has basically no subtlety whatsoever in her entire body. She plays with fire. She sure does. Yeah. Uh, Karis can fly, but that's pretty much secondary to setting everything your opponent has on fire forever. Right. Littering the board with pyre markers to give your opponent burning and injured, which is a very powerful combination. Uh, she also can charge and make ranged attacks, which makes her extremely mobile. Yeah. Uh, her crew also likes to set fires. Mm -hmm. um, they're split between fire elemental types that can be on fire all day and not care, and humans that maybe want to be on fire but can take damage from it. So right. you have to very carefully manage the amount of burning that your own crew has. Right. She, very much like Nellie in one of our previous videos, can use burning as a resource, whereas Nellie uses said, distracted. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, just so. But she also has a title version. Uh, in the title version, she's pretty much letting loose. Uh, mm -hmm. In her title version, she wants to be on fire, and she wants her crew to be on fire, which lets them build in suits, which is extremely powerful. Mm -hmm. um, title versions, The title version of Karis, Karis Reborn, is pretty much trying to charge into melee and just charge back and forth over your opponents, slicing them to pieces, setting them on fire, mm -hmm. and dropping pyre markers everywhere. Um, she supports her crew a little bit by letting them use their burning to put triggers in play, but mostly what she's just doing is burning things to the ground. Yeah, and to your point, she is an excellent starter master, especially the original version of Karis. Mm -hmm. um, relatively easy to grasp the way that the crew works, 
uh, but very powerful and definitely a master that can be in strong contention for top of the faction. Absolutely. The next master we're going to talk about is another dual faction, Marcus. Uh, Marcus splits his time between the Arcanists, his original faction, and the Neverborn, a faction he's just recently joined in third edition. Um, Marcus came to Malifo to study its wonderful wildlife, all the new creatures that didn't exist Earthside. But since then, he's kind of gone native a bit. He's allowed Malifo's primordial magic to change him and make him much more youthful, much stronger, and much more wild and dangerous. So Mal Marcus is a beast mage, and his keyword, Chimera, is all about Malifo's beasts. Big, stompy, chompy beasts. Oh, That's yeah. right. He can hire any beast in whatever faction he declares without mm -hmm. paying any kind of tax. And he can improve those beasts by giving them mutation upgrades. Yep. Uh, and when a beast mutates, it could get big horns or wings or armor plates, anything mm -hmm. to make it tougher or stronger in exactly the way you need. So he's very flexible. Yeah, definitely. He's a master that really focuses on uh, improving his crew. Uh, giving a giant Cerberus wings so that it can fly across the table mm -hmm. and chop your opponent's models to bits. Mm -hmm. um, he can take a giant snake and perhaps give it camouflage so that nobody can actually charge it and engage it in melee. All sorts of cool stuff like that. Absolutely. In his title version, he's taken it a step further. Uh, Marcus, the original, likes to put mutations on his beasts, but Marcus, the title, Marcus Alpha, has turned into a beast himself. Yeah, point uh, of order. I think we actually call him Barkus. Barkus or Meowkus. Meowkus, that's a good one. He's a big werewolf creature, and this more advanced version of Marcus is really focused on getting it done himself, slapping people with his claws, putting those mutations on himself, and he can spread them out because whenever a model in his crew changes its mutation, the old one can go to a nearby model, so yes. it spreads throughout his crew, and you can shift them on the fly however you need mm -hmm. to make your crew able to do what it needs to do in that moment. He's a lot of fun. Um, he's a little complicated. A little complicated. To yeah, track sure. all those mutations. Yep. It's There's a lot of mental math you have to do. Um, but the trade-off is that when you have those mutations, you're able to counter whatever your opponent's doing in the moment. That's right. I think he rewards a bit more of an understanding of the game, but he's very strong. Yeah, he's a master that can really shift gears when you need him to, which is quite cool. All right, cool, that's Marcus. The next master we're gonna be talking about is another dual faction master, Mei Fang. Mm -hmm. uh, she works for the Arcanists and the Ten Thunders because her job is to build the railways that Malifo needs to keep the soul stones flowing. Mm -hmm. So with her keyword, the foundry, she lays the track and makes sure that the soul stones are staying on schedule. But unbeknownst to the Arcanists, the Ten Thunders have already paid for her loyalty, and so she works for them as well, both laying track yep. and sabotaging it to make sure that the Guild and the Arcanists maybe have critical failures just right. when they need them. Uh, so the way she plays, though, is much more straightforward. Oh, yes. Yeah, she is a melee beater that focuses on dealing damage and controlling your opponent's crew. Um, she is a master who can get right into engagement. She can hit hard, and she can hit multiple times per activation, uh, she can. She also has a mechanic where she can pretty much guarantee the suits that she needs for her attacks. Um, she can actually get more attacks per activation than a lot of other models in the entire game of Malifo. I remember in first edition, there was actually a flowchart someone published of all the different ways that Mei Feng's attacks could trigger each other. It was pretty insane. Um, but she's very strong, and because you can lay down scrap markers and then jump between them, mm -hmm. uh, she can cover a huge amount of distance very quickly. Yeah, definitely. Her titled version, Mei Feng Foreman, plays completely differently than the original master. Oh, yeah. This version focuses on buffing her crew, giving out shielded, healing her models, and making sure that her models can get into position. Um, she can really turn the metal golem up to 11. And the survivability of her crews, mm -hmm. Mei Feng Foreman, is insane. Yeah. Uh, I remember playing a tournament game against her where I don't think I killed a single model. Uh, mm -hmm. And I was playing Ophelia, which is a pretty killy keyword. Yeah. Uh, the amount of just shielding and defense she can put out is really incredible. Yeah, and she can really do a lot of ping damage as well. Uh, her, in combination with Sparks, can turn all those scrap markers that are out on the field into sources of hazardous terrain. Uh, and she can also deal damage to enemy models when scrap markers are paced, uh, placed in proximity to them. So Mei Feng, either way you, you play with her, is really good and really focused on those scrap markers. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested in a crew that has a lot of speed, but also a lot of durability, yeah. you could definitely do worse than picking Mei Feng. Definitely. 
The next master we're going to be talking about is Rasputina. Now, we talked earlier about the divide between the MNSU and the Arcanists. Mm -hmm. Rasputina is all in on the Arcanist side. Yes. Uh, Rasputina was originally a convict laborer who came to Malifaux, uh, and she was sentenced to work in the Soulstone Mines, but she escaped into the mountains. And she probably would have frozen to death there, except she found the prison of the tyrant December, mm -hmm. a disembodied entity of cold and famine. And December has put its power into Rasputina, and so now she's the leader of its cult. Mm -hmm. The cult of December is frankly terrifying. It's oh, yeah. It's a, a bunch of cannibals. Cannibals, yeah. Cannibals, ice spirits, uh, beasts from the high mountains, but they all respect and obey Rasputina because they fear her. Yes. Uh, and there's a very good reason for that. There sure is. So Rasputina is, at her core, a damage-dealing master. Uh, she specializes in using blasts and shockwaves, to really punish your opponent's crew from bun uh, for bunching up. She also has easy access to giving out slow, uh, which is pretty critical, and staggered, um, which can really help slow your opponent's crew down, keep them bunched up so that you can keep punishing them with multiple shockwaves and blast markers over and over again. And let's not forget the Ice Golem. Oh, yeah. The Ice Golem absolutely makes a mess of things. Uh, Rasputina's crew generates these ice pillars, too. So even while she's punishing you and smashing you with your ice powers, mm -hmm. she's slowing you down and she's blocking off the board with these ice pillars so you can't navigate and you can't fight back. She's very nasty. Yeah. And Rasputina was recently adjusted via errata so that she can now use those ice pillars to help move her crew up the board, which gets around one of the real failings that they used to have, which was speed. Yeah, the December keyword is very cool now. There's a lot of flexibility cool. uh -huh. in play to them. Uh, and especially now with Rasputina's title, Rasputina Abominable. Uh, so Rasputina's title plays very differently. The original is very much a blaster. Uh, she's just trying to sh throw as much ice at you as possible and kill you that way. Rasputina Abominable is much more defensive and supporting. She has lots of abilities to push her crew around um, and to give them shielded, mm -hmm. which is very strong. It helps keep your models alive, especially the armored golem, which when it's shielded is frankly unreasonable to remove. Right. Uh, she can also summon new models, which is very new. The original Rasputina doesn't touch summoning at all, uh, but the new one can actually kind of carve new minions out of ice, mm -hmm. which has some very interesting effects because a lot of December's models, the minions that they play with are maybe not the most efficiently costed, mm -hmm. but when you're summoning them, you are now getting to benefit from this model without having to pay for it. Yeah, that changes the math quite a bit. Yep. Um, and she still, obviously, because she's Rasputina, has some ability to put the hurt on your enemy. Mm -hmm. um, but mostly she's doing it through her ice pillar markers. So if your yep. opponent is near a marker, she can reach out and touch them. Yeah, and one really key component of uh, Raspi is she's one of the few masters in the game that actually has Ruthless, uh, which goes a long way towards getting around uh, things like terrifying, manipulative, so on and so forth that would normally make it difficult for your master to do their job. So I think there's a lot of interesting play in Rasputina now. She can really clutter up the board, but also do a lot of damage. And she's, I think, a good balanced master for people who are interested in all the different aspects of the game. Definitely. And the two versions of her uh, title, or her, her two titles, I should say, play differently enough that you can really touch a lot of different parts of the game with just this one crew. Next, we're going to talk about Sandeep. Uh, Sandeep Desai originally studied... Uh, in a secluded monastery. And he would have probably done that forever, except for the guild. Uh, the guild came, and because Sandeep's master had been speaking out against their authority, they had him killed. And that triggered Sandeep's rage. Mm -hmm. uh, in that rage, he took up a cursed club, a gada, and he released the spirit that was bound inside it, Banasuva. It was a powerful elemental spirit. Mm -hmm. Banasuva killed the guild oppressors, but now Sandeep had to deal with the fact that he had unleashed this force of devastation onto the world. So Sandeep wants to use Banasuva's power to fight against the oppressive authority of the guild, yes. but he also wants to keep Banasuva controlled because uncontrolled, Banasuva's flaming rage could yeah. do enormous damage to innocent people. Definitely. So Sandeep's crew is very interesting because half of it are Sandeep's followers, uh, academics, people who study magic, his Shastravidya guards, and the other half are these wild, uncontrolled elemental forces, mm -hmm. these gay men and these golems. Uh, and so the key to making a Sandeep crew work is getting these two halves to right. mix together. Trying to get them to work in combination with each other. And one thing that's very interesting about Sandeep is that even there are abilities on his own card that will only affect academics and other abilities that will only affect elementals. So learning the intricacies of his card and the way that the interactions between the two aspects of his crew work are critical for making sure that you can make it function. 
So the, as for how he plays, he's mostly a summoner. I'd say he's probably the Arcanist's biggest summoner. Uh, he can summon game in, which are little elemental spirits. They come in wind, fire, mm -hmm. ice, poison, cool ranch, all the different flavors yeah. of elemental. Uh, but he can combine these into big hulking golems, sure which can. are much more dangerous. Yeah. I mean, if you can you can play a Sandeep crew that by the end of turn one has three different golems on the table at the same time, and that is a lot of beef for your opponent to chew through. It really is. Uh, and there's also, of course, the flexibility of being able to summon whatever kind of gaming you need. Absolutely. Uh, so as for his title, though, Sandeep's title is very interesting. He's a font of magic now. And most critically, he is now an elemental himself. Yep. So all those rules that benefit elementals, he can take advantage of. Yep. Very cool. Yeah, I mean, he, the Sandy crew for, through both versions are really kind of the premier marker dropping crews in, in the game as well. I mean, you can drop ice pillars, scrap, um, pyre markers, mm -hmm. all that stuff on the table, and you can literally litter the board with them. Sandeep Font of Magic can utilize those markers to effect, uh, increasing the damage of his attack and increasing the versatility of his crew. He can also hand out staggered through those markers. Sure can. Uh, so he has a lot of interesting ways that he can use the markers that his crew generates to debuff the enemy and just straight up deal damage to them. Mm -hmm. um, so Sandeep in both versions uh, is a little bit complex, I'd say. He is. He's definitely one of the more complex masters in the in the game. Uh, and you also have to buy a lot of models if you you're going to play sure Sandeep. Do. Probably the most expensive crew. He's right up there. Yeah, probably yeah. one of the most expensive crews in the game. Uh, but very rewarding if you are willing yes. to put in the time and the money and the effort to get good at him. He's yeah, he's, a, he's easily a crew that you could just solo and yeah. play nothing but Sandeep and, and have a different game every single time. All right. So the last Arcanist Master is Tony Ironsides. Now, uh, Tony was also one of Ramos's highest lieutenants before mm -hmm. he went to jail, but she, unlike Karis, she was on the MNSU half. Mm -hmm. And actually, it was Tony's faithful decision to betray Ramos to the guild, which led to him going to prison. It was a very difficult decision for her, but ultimately she felt like she had to because Ramos's ambition was starting to be dangerous to the Arcanists and yeah. the MNSU. Um, so Tony herself... What used to be his leg breaker, yeah. and that is pretty much on display in her original <laughs> yeah. version, Tony Ironsides. Yeah, that's what she does. Uh, original Tony Ironsides would just get into the middle of your opponent's crew, try and engage as many models as possible, would actually pull more of your opponent's models into her sphere of influence, and she would just break legs. So she generates adrenaline tokens, a unique mechanic to her, and the more adrenaline tokens she has... Uh, she can spend them to do uh, more damage. Yep. She can spend them to uh, declare triggers. Yep. Uh, she can basically use these adrenaline tokens to just be even deadlier. And you yep. do not want to be engaged with Tony. Nope, definitely and not. Even if you are, good luck killing her. She is very, very hard to remove. Yes, very difficult to kill. There are a couple of few tech picks that you can use to try and bring her down. But uh, even then, very, very difficult master to handle. And her crew itself does a great job at helping keep her up. I mean, between Fitzsimmons reducing damage, uh, her totem mouse healing her to keep her alive, and the captain staying close by to protect her from shooting attacks, she can be a pretty tough model to handle. So the MNSU crew all have these abilities, these grit abilities, which are special actions uh, that trigger when they're at below half health mm -hmm. and give them bonuses. And when they're near Tony or her lawyer, Amina Nadu, they always count it being below half health, they which sure means do. as long as you're bubbling up with Tony, your models are doing a lot of damage. Yeah, they're doing a lot of damage. They're staying on the board and uh, generally speaking, being very difficult for your opponent to deal with. So Tony's title version, on the other hand, represents her being promoted to union president. Yeah. After Ramos goes to jail. And so unfortunately for her, she's not really able to mix it up in melee as much. She has to do more work, you know, at a desk, wearing mm -hmm. a suit. But there are trade-offs. Yeah, I mean, she changes completely from being a melee beater and tar pit tank of a model to a control master that can also do some summoning. Mm -hmm. uh, it completely shifts gears between the two different title versions. And now in both versions, she can do some pretty healthy damage. Yeah. Um, Tony Union president is a little bit more fragile, but the trade-off is that she's much more able to affect the board from a distance. She doesn't have to be in melee to make things happen. Right. Uh, I think both versions are a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. It's a cool crew. It's very flavorful. Uh, and Tony's also a pretty good person in the lore, which is not very common in Malfoy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she's, she's pretty much as close as you can get to being a legitimate good guy. 
yeah, in the lore. Yep. So there's definitely reasons to play her. Uh, I would strongly recommend Tony to people who are starting Arcanists, especially if you're coming from a game where you're used to playing with these powerful characters that are able mm-hmm. to really kill things in melee. A lot of Malifaux Masters don't do that. Tony definitely does. Definitely. And if you want your master to stick around until the end of the game, she's top of the heap. Yeah, don't even bother trying to kill her. It's not worth <laughs> the time. It is not worth it. Cool. And that's Tony. And that's Tony. So that was the Arcanists. Yeah, that was the Arcanists. I uh, hope you enjoyed them. The Arcanists are a really cool faction. Uh, we're coming up next with the Neverborn, yep. so stick around for that. But uh, until then, we really hope you've enjoyed this series so far, and we'd like you to check out the articles on Goonhammer that accompany these videos. Mm-hmm. You can find the link in the description. You should also check out Danger Planet's Discord. Definitely. The link is in the description. You can talk about Malifaux. You can talk about any other game. And I'd really encourage you to check out Jesse's podcast, Boring Conversation. It's one of the best Malifaux podcasts there is. Oh, what a guy. If not the best one. And the link for that, you guessed it, is in the description. In the show notes. That's right. All right. Cool. So until next time, in whatever. <laughs>